course, in February, we like to take the opportunity to talk to you, our congregation, about relationships and about marriage. Yeah. This is not only just for That's married right. folks, but it's for our singles. How many of you are single? Let me see your hand. How many of you are singles? Woo! Wow, wow, wow. Wow, that's half the congregation. <laughs> anyway, anyway, this is, this is, this, what we're going to share is vitally important for yes. you as a single. I wish we would have known right. this. We found out later uh, what was causing some of the rifts or some of the problems and frustrations in our own marriage when we got married. Because how many of you know when you get married, you're not marrying a perfect person? I knew that because I wasn't one. You know, <laughs> but the fact is that we fall romantically in love with somebody yeah. and we're so infatuated that we're blinded in, in, the, in the dating process. Because actually, dating is a fraud. Somewhat. <laughs> it is. We don't mean it to be, Because right? nobody knows who you are because you put on, we, we put on the mask. Put on our we put on our foot best foot forward up front. And, they, and it's not until we get married and get behind closed, we get behind closed doors in our own homes or apartments or wherever, and we find out, wait a minute. Reality sets in. <laughs> I don't know this person. I thought I knew this person, but boom. It's a little different. Totally, completely different. But there's, there's a mindset that a lot of times, and the world actually is the one that creates this for us. Not God, but the world creates it. We have a mindset that when we go in, that she is marrying the prince that is perfect, and I'm marrying the princess that. She makes the birds sing in harmony. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and every drop of rain is glad that it found her. Heaven must have made her. He heaven must have made her just for me. Ain't no woman like the one I got. Ain't no woman like the one I got. It's the ground she walks on. So that... That's our concept. Anybody have it's that concept? Wonderful. Anybody, anybody with me have that, have that concept? Sure. And so I, I'm looking for her to meet some of my deepest needs. And vice versa. I, I'm looking for her to fulfill kind of a void and emptiness on the inside of me. And actually, that's exactly one of the things that God said. It's not good for man to be alone. Somebody I mean, there was one that. point in my life that I thought God had forgotten my prayer had totally forgot that I, I did want to be married. Because you were and how old? Let's, we don't have to go into that. <laughs> so, okay, I was 33. By the time I got to 30, I thought, okay, you know. <laughs> well, I knew I was going to have to take some... I knew I was going to have to have somebody take care of me when I got older. And I will. I will. That's my plan. So I wanted somebody strong and young. Yes. And beautiful. Anyway, yeah, a... so... Uh, what are we talking about? So, so, when we, so when we get into the marriage, we come into the marriage, even when we're dating. Right. Because, like I said, dating blinds us, literally, to a lot of the characteristics and a lot of traits and a lot of the human nature of somebody that we're getting married to. And then we have that eye-opening experience. But a lot of times when we get married or come into relationship, we're expecting the person right. to do for us what only literally God can do. That's good. And we can get to the place that we, we look at that person and actually put them on an idol. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that our marriage... Even though some things can happen, we want to make sure that our marriage stays in the place where it was when we first laid eyes on one another, we fell in love, and man, everything was just, it was really, really good at that time. So, our, our question to you today is this, do you want to have a marriage, and you that's single, do you, when you come into a marriage, you want to have a marriage that looks like this? Oh, Mercedes. Or do you want a marriage like Tave and I had when we got married? 
That was, yeah, yeah. That well, was our first car. It worked. It was kind of a little rattle bucket everywhere that we went, <laughs> but hey, it got us where we needed to go. But you know, whether you end up with either one, and even if you achieve that Mercedes, uh, that attain to that Mercedes level, we still have to make sure that we maintain a focus, that we don't get distracted and off on some dead end road, or that we don't end up, uh, you know, texting and driving and end up with a smash up. And especially when you end up with one of those cars with that high powered engine inside, you want to make sure you're going by the manual to take care of that thing, right? Right. right. Because we definitely don't want to end up like this. Because if we don't maintain our focus, this is very often what happens. And we expect that for all of us. Like Pastor said, you're going to have the little, uh, little uh, thunder, fender, benders. fender benders and the little crashes and everything. Right. That, that can be fixed. That, that's that, that's, that's going to happen. I mean, it, that, that happens in our life. It happens in our marriages at times. And the reason it does is because we are two imperfect people coming together, trying and thinking we're going to have a perfect marriage. Okay, which literally, we, there's nothing on this earth that is perfect. There's only one that is perfect. Even Jesus said that. It's God is only perfect. But yet at the same time, we, we'll, we'll have some fender benders. We right. may have some wrecks and things like that. What we don't want we don't our want marriage to do. We don't all. want our relationships and our lives to end up. We don't want them to end up here. And like unfortunately, that. Amen? there's a lot of relationships. Can can you say amen? In this world, that have so ended up we, like that. we want we want to take you we want to take yeah. you into a in a in, into a story in the Bible where a person was doing everything that she could to try to achieve perfection in a marriage. She was trying to get fulfillment. And her emptiness gone. Right. She was trying to to get to the place where where a, a man literally can meet every need in her life, which you're going to find out in this story that that's an impossibility because right. no woman and no man can meet your deepest needs. That's right. It's impossible. That's not the way you're created. But when I go into a marriage or I go into a relationship thinking that, then literally it, it is almost doomed for failure. But like Tava said, there's a Holy Ghost body shop. And even when we have wrecks and we, we have incidences, we have fender benders, we can fix those if we will lay down our pride, lay down our ego, uh, lay down what it, basically us being self for self, and we can lay that down and we can come before the Lord or we can even come through somebody in counseling. I, I know when we got married, because I had never been married before, you know, and, and I was used to being single. So I was set in my ways in a lot of different areas. Uh, so there was a lot of things that I did that hurt her feelings. Uh, I, I was trying to make sure that we had this front of having a perfect marriage. And yet we were having to work some things out behind the scenes. And it was not until I went and, and subjected myself to someone who could counsel and help me and show me some things in the Word of God, uh, young in our marriage, that, that helped me tremendously to understand what I needed to do as, as a husband. And I'll never forget that after I got this help uh, from, from, a, from a person uh, that... Uh, that and, 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 and let me just say this, because that's exactly what we do here at, at the church. That's right. that's good. We have help yeah. uh, for folks... If I, if I have, if, if, I'm, if I'm egotistical and I have pride in my life, uh, I'm not going to go for help. You know, I'm just going to let it run its course. And a lot of times it, it, it ends up very, very bad and can end up in the, in the junkyard. And, and we, don't, we don't want that. But then there was a time that I got help. And in getting help, I started praying. Now, I did pray, but I didn't pray a whole lot about me. I prayed about the blessings of God. I prayed about the promises of God. I prayed about everybody else, including her, asking God to straighten her out, <laughs> to help her to, I did need some help. to help her to understand my role, 
one of the other problems that I had was that when I grew up, my mama, and I say it because that's the way I call it, my mama, she always waited on us. She served us. She did everything for us. You did marry your my, mama. My mother, <laughs> my mother never sat down at the kitchen table. She stayed at the stove. She would eat right there, standing up, just like this. I saw this until the day that I left home. She would stand there, and she would watch our plates, and then she would say, Honey, you want some more? I got plenty more over here in the pot. You want some more? Come on, eat some more. You need to eat some more. And she would always be serving. She was always doing everything for us. Okay. Awesome. So when I got married, I thought Tava was Ruth Bryce. I thought Tava was going to do the same thing Mama did. I was serving. It just wasn't quite so old school. Yeah. And so, and then I found out she didn't know how to cook collards. Uh oh. <laughs> Trouble. So, I tried to get, I, I wanted to get people to teach her how to cook collards, but she could not handle the smell. So she was, she was like, so we had. Let them stick with their anointing. Yeah. Is what I say. Yeah. On, in, in, in doing that. So anyway, so, so I went and got help, but then, listen to me, then I started praying. And I'll never forget the morning I went into my prayer closet. And here's something that's so key. Every one of us as men, we need a private time with God. And women. And, and, and women also. We men, we need a private time with God. Jesus said it like this. He said, when you go into the secret place... Remember Psalms 91 says, he who abides under the shadow of the Almighty, you know, will dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Well, where is that secret place? Jesus said, go into the, go into the secret place, shut the door. There are times that every one of us as men, we need to shut the door and get by ourselves. It doesn't matter if it's five minutes, ten minutes, or whatever. I, I started out with like 10, 15 minutes, and then it just grew from there. Yeah. Okay? So I would go in, and I would spend time. But I would go in and start praying, and I prayed about marriage. And I'll never forget the time that the Lord spoke to me right here in my heart, and he said this. I went in, and I started praying about some things. And he said, I don't want you to pray another thing about my daughter and the gift that I gave you. He called her daughter. His gift to me. And uh, he said, I want your prayer to center in on you. And not on her. He said, I can take care of my daughter. I need for you to have an understanding of the way I created you and your role inside this marriage. And he said, and then, he said, you'll see things turn around and change only if I can change you. And he said, I can change you if you will allow me to change you. But he said, you're selfish. You're a perfectionist. Um, you're a control freak. This is what God's speaking to me. And all this, I mean, he started going through all this. He actually said, he said, when you go on vacation, you never ask anybody wh wh where they want to go on vacation. It's all about you and where you want to go. And you tell everybody what they're going to do and how they're going to enjoy the vacation. Which was absolutely true. I mean, I would arrange it all and then surprise everybody. <laughs> You know, I didn't give anybody an opportunity to say, hey, you know, what, what do you think about this? And we, we can go into this particular area. So God really started dealing with me concerning myself. And I had to open myself up. See, I'm telling you all this because there is an anointing on me to be an open book. I don't like that anointing at times. But God's anointed me to do that. I just open up to you and let you know. You know, because a lot of times you can look at somebody in the pulpit and say, oh, if I could only be like them. You know, if, I, if, I could, if my husband could be like him. Oh, if my husband would just be like pastor. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you, I was not the husband I am today after 32 years, what I started out to be. And by the, by the way, if you knew the way I started out to be, you probably wouldn't want to pray that your husband would be like me. If you, if you want to do that, pray. But here's, here's, here's listen to this. It took me from the time we got married to 32 years, and I'm still walking in it and still learning. It didn't come overnight. 
I made, a, I, I made mistakes. I did things. But what happened was is that I loved God so much and I valued Him first place in my life that I began to spend time with Him and spending time with Him and spending time in the Word. And at the end of the service, I'm going to show you exactly what God told me to start praying that changed my life and changed my marriage. And when I, when I did that, then the overflow of my relationship with God and God teaching me how to love as Jesus loved, that overflow began because I would get my cup and then God began to teach me and that overflow would begin to come into her life because I realized that I was there not for her to serve me, but for me to serve her. And when I started serving her, she delighted in serving me. And when I started loving her the way God wanted me to love her, the, the way he wanted me to do things and pay attention to her and listen to her, all of a sudden, it started reciprocating back on me, and I didn't even have to command her. <laughs> Love me. I didn't ha have to do what some people say, well, I'm the head of the household. Bless God, this is the way God did it. This is the way he did it, and you will submit. You know, I never had to do that. Right. Because once I understood about loving and serving my wife, then all of that came. I started treating her like a queen. She started treating me like a king. Because I respected her, I started loving her, and I started serving. And you heard what I said last week. Well, I, I went to a seminar that was teaching me how to be a man, how to be a husband. And as I went there, I went there by myself because I wanted to get it all in. I, I went there, I went to all the men's meetings, I went to everything that I could so I can learn how to be that husband. And so therefore, therefore, when I came back, I went up to her and I said, let me just say something to you. And I, and, and, and I told her, I said, you're not going you're, you're to get more rewards than I get in heaven. And I said, because I'm going to outserve you it's because of, of what God had done in my life. Well, the message today is titled, and, and I want to say that afresh to you, uh, learning to love like Jesus. That's what pastor's talking about right now is that wouldn't it be great if there was this big magic wand or a genie jumped out and said, boom, you're going to be just like Jesus. That's our promise, that we ultimately become more and more and more like him. But we want to say to you that this message is not just about marriages. This principle that we're going to see today just come to life off the pages of Scripture is going to be inspiration for you to see that not only is this something that we would hope to attain to, but it is doable. And it's applicable to your friendships at school, your deeper relationships with family and, and possible loved ones for the future, and especially for your, your married life and for the kids in your married life. We want to make sure that none of us uh, approach this message with, with a kind of a guarded sense that either I'm not in that season, something's happened to me. We're not, nor is God here, to chide you and to condemn you if you've been the victim of failed relationships or if you, but for some, like you may have started like pastor and some thing, and myself, of course, and, and, and some things happen and you've been through a divorce or two. This is not about this, and you're going to see that in the, in the message today. This is a message of hope, and today we're all, all of us are going to get to look into learning to love like Jesus. And there's not and a one of us, well. there's not a one of us in this room. Not one. That is married, that has not made mistakes, that not wish me. we hadn't have said things, done That's things. Right. There's not a person in here because we all have all to deal with this flesh right. that we that we enter, enter uh, that we're living in. Right. There, real quickly, the, the story. How many of you have heard the woman at the well story? Jesus goes Love to the meets story. the woman at the well. Well, here's here's what happened. Jesus comes. Uh, Jesus comes. He's tired. He's going uh, to, uh, he's, he's, he's going, getting ready to go through to uh, Jerusalem. They're 36 miles outside of Jerusalem. He come to a place called Sychar. It is a place where the Samaritans lived. They actually had built a temple there to worship God because uh, it was what, what we call Jacob's well. Because when they went to Jerusalem, because they were uh, Samaritans, and, and Samaritans were called that, they were actually called half-Jews. And the, and, the, and the Jews, full-blooded Jews, would have nothing to do with them. So the one thing that you and I 
look at concerning that is he starts out with this story with facing prejudice and racism yeah. right off the bat because he shows up at this well. He's tired. The disciples go off. They, they're going to get food in the city. Jesus is thirsty. This woman comes out at 12 o'clock noon. The Bible says it's six hour. That's the noon time. She comes out. She's got a bucket. She's going to get some water. The reason she's coming out at noon because nobody goes to get That's water right. at noon. And the reason she's it's coming out is because she has had five failed marriages. And the person that she's living with right now, she's not even married. Right. She finally just said, heck with this marriage stuff. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to have this anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to be committed. I'm just going to live with somebody and let them take care of me if, if they want to. This is, this is what I'm going to do. Because she still really thought that relationship with a man or relationship with a human being was the meaning of life. So she comes to the well. Jesus says, give me a drink. And she looks at him and says, what? You're a Jew and you're asking me, a Samaritan, to give you a drink? Because even though they did commerce together and and work and traded business things, they would have nothing to do with each other. They would not drink together. They would not eat together. I mean, they were just totally, completely segregated. And even Jews... When Jews were going to Jerusalem, That's coming right. from different parts and, and, uh, of, uh, of, of Israel, they would spend a whole day going around Samaria if they had to. Yeah. And not even going through, going through there. So, so Jesus is looking at the woman and he says, give me a drink. And um, she says, well, you know, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. What are you talking about? And then he goes on and says this. And he, she said, well, he's recognize he has no bucket to draw from then he says this he says I can give you drink and my drink will, that I give you you will never thirst again wow and she went what yeah give me some of this now remember she's a social outcast she's probably looked upon as an adulterer and going through the culture of probably a har- harlot yeah she's looked upon as a failure she has no significance and meaning to her life right now because of what's happened to her. I mean, she's a total wreck, failure. And here Jesus is talking to her. Remember, Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. That's right. Jesus would leave the 99 and go That's after Jesus the one. That's Jesus' love. This, right. it, Jesus is doing this on purpose. Well, I'm yes. just telling you right now, no matter where you are in your life right now, yes. I want to tell you, Jesus is right here. Jesus is right where you are. He still loves you. He cares about you. And he'll do everything he can to get your life back together and put it back together. So, 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 so they're having this conversation. Jesus said, I can give you living water, a fountain on the inside of you that, that, that will come up with streams that will change your whole life. And... Uh, and then she goes, she says, and he says, go get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're right. Now he's operating in the word of knowledge. He said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. Whoa. And she goes, okay. <laughs> uh-uh. She says, well, I recognize that you're a prophet. Smart well, you've got to understand prophets in the Old Testament. That probably scared her about yeah. half out Redoomed. of her her own skin yeah. thinking what what is this prophet going to do so he recognizes the prophet and then she says well she changes the subject she says well we're supposed to worship on this mountain and Jesus and you Jews worship in Jerusalem and Jesus turns around and he says the hour is coming and the time is now where those who worship the Lord it won't be a particular place but they who worship him will worship him in spirit and truth so here's what she's saying Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying to the woman this. He's saying, the problem that you're having has to do with the well that you're drinking out of. That's the problem. In the the original uh, formation, creation of men and woman, we find in the garden that God himself handcrafted what they would look like how would they would relate to one another he first made man in his own image they had began to establish that relationship with one another and then he said i love this it's not good for man to be alone let me all hear everyone say yay amen all the men all the men said, said, said yes and the women Amen. yes 
But you see through the verses that follow that there was this interaction that was ongoing. He didn't show up and go, Zap, you're a God man, you're one made in my image, and check me later. He interacted with them. And that, when Adam and Eve fell, this is what they lost was that relationship. They were lost the relationship that they could enjoy together with God, and that's where they began to thirst. That was the first place that they began to feel insecure and to feel fear and to begin to have relational conflicts. So we see now, this is incredible that Jesus has come to this well, and he coming as one created and brought to earth as the uh, representation of God and what it would be to, you know, representing who the Father was and how much the Father loved those that were on the planet at that time that Jesus reached. But he was also demonstrating to those that were around him and now to this woman at the well that he came, though he was tired. Don't you love that the Bible lets us know that no matter how spiritual you are, you may have seasons you need to sit down and be refreshed. That's good news. But Jesus came here, and, and he comes with a, his, his spirit man is full. We see all through the Gospels how he would take time away with the Father. He'd go into a deserted place, an isolated place, up in the mountains. He would always make sure that, like Pastor had said earlier, he found that secret place with his Father so that his thirsting, his life, was filled to overflowing. So you've got the natural happening. He's tired. He sits down. Watch this. The woman who comes with, with her bucket... With with her needs, what she, at that time, man, water was life. Water, we, you know, they couldn't turn on the faucet. They couldn't just go and flip lights on. She had to go carry physically the bucket to provide for her and the guy she was living with and whoever knows how many, fa how many family members. That's her job. You and I can relate to her because, you know, a lot of times we're just trying to get through our day. We know that we have to have provision for our family and we get into seasons and times that we're just pressing on. We're just doing life as best we can. And yet God is constantly there. I love that. He wasn't supposed to have been there other than God himself planted him right in front of this woman with these needs. The water inside that she was going to draw up from a well meant that her house would have hydration, that her house would have something to cook with, that her house would have something to water the, the garden that they were going to reap from, that her house would have, this is important water, right? But this water that Jesus himself is asking for in this moment Think about it. You know, she, he was just asking for a little cup of that water. And what big deal would it have been for her to just to say, okay, sure, have a bucket. It's going to be, le I mean, have a cup. This is going to be just one little less quantity for me to lug back to my miserable life. And what big deal of, would it have been? But think about the relational stance that she was coming from at that time. What was her history? And here's a guy sitting at the well, and when she looks at him, she, she distinguishes, she knows this is a Jewish person. You know what? That's important, especially when you think about some of our hard places in our lives where we have relational challenges that it seems like there's no way this is going to ever change because you know what? It's already been like that for weeks, for months, for years. But an encounter with God, an encounter with the presence of God in that moment made a difference that she had never experienced before. The men she knew before had brought damage and disappointment appointment, this is a man that stepped up representing that even the Jews and the, the uh, Samaritans had hope because of what God was bringing through his son, Jesus Christ. That's very powerful. So here she is, and as she approaches him, and he says, hey, if you would have recognized this gift that you see sitting here, instead of a love life that would have maybe had him snap off at her and like, hey, look, I'm just asking you know, I could see myself, McDonald's, and they go, ma'am, we don't have that today. And you want to go, uh, I'm just asking for just something. So, you know, just out of our own humanity, we might tend to, instead of a love walk, we're tired, we just want our food. No, Jesus didn't do that. He, sir, he began to talk to her about how he could serve her, how he could meet some deep needs in her life. That's the kind of love that we want to learn to walk in today, that even though we might be tired, as someone comes up to us, bumps into our life and brings, uh, you know, frustration and a stress to us, 
that we have this bucket full so that we have something to measure back to her. And watch this. He said, if you had recognized this gift, you and I have him coming at us every single day to encourage us. He definitely wants to meet us in that secret place. If she would have recognized that, he said to her, then you would have asked me and I would have given. He didn't say, you know, if you can go ahead and, and organize your life, get yourself all straightened out. He said, no, I was ready. To, I'm ready right now to give it. And then he, when she says, you know what, I, th- I see that you're a prophet. He says, go get your the husband. It wasn't that he was trying to embarrass her that she had this man she was living with. He was trying to say, I understand what's happening in your life. And I don't just want to give a cup to you church family. I want to give this cup to whoever you're in relationship, whatever is affecting your life right now. Bring it. Bring it. Because I have that same, that same living water that I have ready to provide for them. That's a powerful truth about this particular message. Again, the two things. Something that seemed to be impossible in an encounter with God was suddenly made possible because the love of God was there. That kind of love was there and the fact that God cared about her personally and he cared about the life that she was involved in at that moment. And notice that uh, this to me is amazing. Jesus did not look at her and said, you know what we need right now is we need some marriage counseling. We we just need to sit down or listen, listen, here's uh, uh, Pastor Eddie is a great counselor. Just go see him. You know, those guys were a Everything. Bunch of losers. Go see the you marriage just need counseling. To keep go see Pastor David. None go, of those things. Just, just talk to somebody. He didn't say that. Jesus was sincerely right. concerned about the real her thirst. misperception and misunderstanding concerning relationship. Right. Notice, notice this. Jesus, notice what he didn't say. He didn't look at her and say, you know what, I feel so sorry for you because you have married five duds. Boneheads. I mean, you have married five losers. Wow, you're probably the, you're probably the unluckiest woman in all the earth. I've never met anybody that, that is so unlucky like you that you would marry one loser after another. He did not even address her social or physical issues. Didn't say a word about that. He went straight to where he knew that the problem lies. And that was this. He simply said, you're drinking from the wrong well. Right. He said, you know what? It's not about where you worship. It's not about religious trappings because the Samaritans believed this was the place. The Jewish believed that Jerusalem was the place for them to worship. He said, guess what? It isn't about that. It is about that God is looking right now for those to worship me, him, in spirit and in truth. This means this is heart to heart. This is not just facade. This is not just trappings of religious and trying to look like you got it all together. Jesus communicated to that issue in her life that was thirsting and said, this is what's going to fill it. God's looking right now. Notice, he is looking. It's not just us. Oh, I just need to find God. I need to find significance. Jesus pointed out the very truth that was going to reconcile her life and get her in a place where now she would have that thirst filled by saying the original intent. God wants us back to that place that we're walking with him in our relationship so that our cup is running over, that we're truly loving, that we're fulfilled, and we're not looking for another person to fulfill us. When, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they, it was, the Bible says in Proverbs, a threefold cord is not easily broken. That's good. See, when God created Adam and Eve, he did not create Adam and Eve to now go out and multiply and be fruitful the whole world and leave him out. Right. When God created Adam and Eve, it was this. It was not Adam and Eve in the garden. It was God, Adam, and Eve. Yeah. And then it would be the whole human race. So Adam and Eve, when they were created, there were four basic needs. Yes. That they had to have as a human being. It's human. And only God could give those to them. 
They couldn't get it from one another. They couldn't get it outside of God, and God knew that. That's the reason the Bible says that God came in the cool of the day. He walked in the garden, and when he came and walked in the garden, he was revealing to them who he was. He had created them out of love because God is love. So God created uh, two individuals that would multiply and fill the whole earth that he could give a revelation. He created them in his own image so that he could uh, relate to them. Uh, they could relate to him. He, that he would give them revelation, progressive revelation of who he was. And then he would, he would constantly pour into them about their love, uh, the love for one another, love for him, love for one another, and understand how to operate in this relationship. And so, so when Adam and Eve was created, God created them in a way that there were four basic needs, and it's four basic needs, and it's the deepest needs of every single human being, and there is not another human being that can meet it. That's good. Can meet either four of these. And so, so when, and Tava's going to tell you what those needs are in just, just a minute. See, when they were spending time with God. Yeah. God was revealing himself to them. Mm -hmm. It was going to be through eternity because they were never created to die. That's right. They were created to walk in a relationship and fellowship with God. The more they walked in relationship and fellowship with him and spent time with him, the more their eyes would be open to who they were. They would receive progressive revelation concerning God's love for them. And those four basic needs, they would, they would operate in that. They would be confident in that. Uh, they would not be selfish in any way, shape, or form. They would not be bickering, fighting, strife, uh, uh, selfishness at, at all. None of that came in until Adam and Eve decided that they didn't want to walk with God anymore. And they came along the side of the rebellion of Satan against God. That thirst, that craving took them to that which destroyed that bond between them and God. It is no different today that the devil designs and points things right. out in to this world, the away. systems of this world, the things that are in this world, to get you to thirst and hunger after those things. Right. See, the Bible says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God. My value, their value, first of all, was God. Their value was Him. 100%. So that, they're, because their value system, their value system was God, their top priority was God, then it, that laid the foundation for their own value system that they had uh, in the earth and that they would operate out of. Yeah. The, their priorities would come out of their number one priority. And because God would reveal to them his love and who he is, then they would love one another just as God right. loves Mimicking them. Him. They would love one yeah. another. They were not there saying, what can you give me? You know, they were just there, what can I give you? What can I do for you? Right. Constantly giving out to one another because of the overflow they got coming from God. Yeah. But see, when they sinned, all of that changed. Yeah. Now, the fellowship changed. All of a sudden, they're out of fellowship with God. Sin comes in, and now the first thing we see, the Bible tells us that in the last days, when it talks, talk, uh, Paul talks about in the last days, it's going to be perilous times. Well, there's a reason it's going to be like that. And then uh, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the coming of the Son of Man. Yeah. And when you have, you have Genesis, the second chapter where Jesus created He's man and woman. Perfect. It's amazing. And then they start multiplying. But because of sin, right. because of the change that took place in their own human nature now, by the time you get to Genesis, the sixth chapter, God is saying, I'm sorry that I even made, made mankind. Right. I'm sorry I meant because the, the intent of his heart, their heart is continually evil. That's what human nature, that's the human nature of this. Thank God he found Noah. You know. Now, out of all of, of the humanity at that time. So now, so now, four basic needs that every human being needs. Yes. Now they were relegated because of sin, because of the fall, because of separated from God. Now they're reg- regulated to get these four basic needs from one another. And it's impossible to get. You saw there in the garden where, and we, we're all aware of this, where, uh, where as soon as they fell, what happened? The scripture tells us that they feared 
First time, the, uh, the opposite of love is fear. Perfect love cast out fear. It, was none a part, it wasn't a part of their consciousness. And immediately when they chose to, to fill that craving, that thirst with something else, immediately that denigration, that, that distortion of what was supposed to be there relationally happened. They began to fear and immediately they began to blame, to blame one another and they were reacting off of fear. Why? Because now they're aware of themselves. And they became they selfish. They were aware of their needs. They were ne they're aware of their fear that I'm going to be judged. Something's gone terribly wrong here. So then they're very much self self-focused and then whatever is out here is going to try to that what I see out here I'm going to be clinging to to try to feel that need inside of me to make me stop feel, feeling uh, uh, lesser than or to be fearful or and, without peace and, and all of a sudden and I want him to do it what, what did Jesus say? Jesus said to the woman at the well she said I'm going to give you a well to drink out of that will be living water. He said that to her. The fountain of the Spirit of God that you will thirst no more. Now, because of their, rebe their rebellion against God, now they're cut off from relationship with God. So now, they don't have now this. here's what Adam's doing. Adam is looking. Now Adam becomes selfish. It's not about us anymore. It's He's about it's the woman you gave me. Any, if God's it, it, it's anymore. not the love of God anymore. Right. It's the love for self. And now, so of course we're going to be offended because that will never right. be able to. And, and so now us. Adam comes over, and now he Adam looks, and he says, "You're my well. Now you give me and fill me up with these things." She can try, but that's never going to fulfill him. It's just going to go out, and he's going to need more. He's going to crave more because of the frustration in here, because he knows that that is not fulfilling him. And likewise for the women. So the four basic needs. The four basic needs that God, now listen, this is so cool. God's wired all of us with this. And listen to the reason why once we talk about what they are. Number one, he made us to require acceptance. Of course, he wants us to accept him, right? And he definitely, as it made us uh, uh, the accepted and the beloved, he's, he's chosen us, but he's wired us to know that we are to crave and to desire and to actually need acceptance. He also, he also has wired us to need identity. This is born again and this is not born again. You need identity. I need to know who I am. What is my life all about? He also has given each one of us secure, a need for security. Of course, if we didn't have that, everything would be in upheaval, in up uproar. We wouldn't be providing security for our families, looking for security and, and getting settled and getting um, integrous in the way that we lived and the way that we made decisions and we settled our lives in a way that we had it ordered. We, he made us with that some, some people, need for some, security. Some people, some people... And, and we've seen this happen right here at the church. Some people will marry based off security. Right. And actually, I believe the Samaritan woman, by the time she was into the sixth man, she was like, let me just try for security. You know, and let, that's, me, that's, let me get my that's, bills paid. That, that, that's what The Bachelor's all about. Is right. that you have women there that know that this man's a millionaire. And they, they're thinking security. I can right. do this. Plus, he's good looking. Yeah. You know, and, and security. So there's a lot of people that will marry because somebody has a good job. So now, we, it's very important if you marry somebody, they do have a job. Yes. That's right. Check that one off the list. But then fourth is, the fourth is that we were created to desire and to need to have a purpose. One of the first things that God did when he walked Adam through the garden is he said, and I want you to tend this garden. My purpose is here. He knew that his purpose was to take care of this place where he lived. That was his purpose, but also to be in relationship with God. So think about the, the, the brilliance that God would wire us for that because without these four uh, characteristics in our life, we wouldn't even be looking for God. Isn't it beautiful that because we have these desires, then we're going to know before we find him that there's something in this world that we should be able to lay hold of that would give us the acceptance, the identity, the security, and the purpose. And that so God has wired us to know him, to want him, to desire him. What happened in the garden is, is that we, misunder we, we began to displace where we would get that from, even though our secondary 
role for these needs to be net, met is going to be through our family, is going to be through relationships, is going to be through best friends, but they're secondary, and they can never provide, as we've been saying over and over again, those perfect provisions through the love of God, right. which is perfect for us. Because you and I are spiritual beings. Right. We live in this body, and the, the spiritual needs that we have only God can give to us. Right. That's the reason that you see people out here that the, the world is just gone crazy. I mean, you look at it and just say, man, this world's crazy. It's, it's in chaos. It, people are, are, are looking like this. And, 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 and so we're running around and, and we're looking at another individual. That's the reason you, uh, people join gangs. Why do they join gangs? They're looking for acceptance. They're looking for acceptance, identity, identity. security, and purpose. Yep. Why does somebody get married? They want to look, they're looking for acceptance. They accept me. They love me. Right. They like me. Oh gosh. And I will, that's good. I will thank you. This thank is you. A good thank thing. you. Give to me. Give right. to me. So they're looking for acceptance. They're looking for identity. Yeah. I, 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 I want to get my identity. Give me my identity. Tell me who I am. No human being can do that. That's right. I want, I want to make sure, tell me, I'm going to be secure. You're, you're going to look after my emotions. You're going to make sure that everything emotionally is good with me. You're going to satisfy all my needs. You're going to, you're going to do all of this stuff for me. It's impossible. I, impossible. But what, what am I saying? That's selfish. When, when, when we get to a place like that, and, and, and you're looking, what's my purpose? Who am I? See, there's so many people today can tell you what they do for a living, but they can't tell right. you who they are. Right. And so, so we are looking for all of those things in people or in things that we do, accomplishments, achievements. We can look for it in education. We can try to find it in every area and every realm that this earth has to offer. Right. And you'll never be oh, satisfied. You'll never be fulfilled. Right. You're never going to, 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 to have that sense of this is it. Because every time that you get somebody and they can't meet that, that, that criteria... They can't fill those basic needs. Then after a while, you get frustrated. Irritated. You start irritating. You start finger pointing. There's strife. There's bickering. Right. There's all Resentment. kinds of things. You don't care about me. You don't care about my emotions. You don't care about me. You don't care about anything. Because you're looking for that person to meet all of those. Right. Only God can do that. And, and, and here's, here's, where we, here's where we stop today. Only God can do that. And you can only fulfill that role with your spouse if you spend time with God. That's right. That's if right. you, if you, and, and by the way, when I say right now, when I'm saying spend time with God, I'm not, I'm not talking about going to church. Because, good. because there's that, people, but... there, there are people sitting in church that are ready to get a divorce next week. So that, that's not doing anything. Correct. Okay, so that, and then all of a sudden we hear, you know, well, well two, two people just divorced, you know, so, and they've been in church for three, four, 15 years. So it's not just church, it's relationship yeah, with God. That's right. It's not until the Lord taught me, son, you will never love your wife the way I love her until you understand and know and accept and receive That's and good. walk in my love. It's good. And you can only do that by the, by the time that you spend with me and let me pour into you. See, this is where we men have a hard time getting into a prayer closet. We, we, I mean, our value comes from work. I mean, we work. We, man, we, we bring the bread home. I mean, we, we do these things, and we get up, and we do, I've done this for you, and I've done that for you, and I've done this and this. I had a guy sitting in my office one day, and he looked. He was sitting there, tears in his eyes. His wife had left him. And he said, I, I, Pastor, I don't, I don't get this. I don't understand. And he went through a list. He actually had a list. It had 25 things on the list. He said, I gave her this, I did this, I sent her here, I bought her this, I went down. He went down the whole list, 25 things, and I'm sitting there listening to him. 
I said, can I see your list just a minute? He said, yeah. So I handed him the list, and I looked at it. I said, wow. I said, look at your list again. Tell me where you are on the list. And, and, he, and he went, he said, what? I said, where are you? Where are you on the list? I said, evidently, the things didn't mean that much to her or she wouldn't have left. And then he just, I mean, he just got real quiet and he started looking at me. And he said, but I, I thought that was telling her that I love her. I said, no, watch me. I love you. That's telling you her. I said, it's not the things that you can buy and do. It is you. It is be she didn't marry things when she married you. She married you. She longs to hear, I love you. Share your life. I love you. To share your love, to share your share time, your to communicate, to sit down and talk. You know, and, 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 and I said, if, if, if all you do is go to work, come home, sit at the television, go eat, want to know where your lunch is, you know, your dinner is, eat and go back to the television, and, and she's been at home all day with kids and stuff, she needs somebody that can talk English to her, not baby, 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 baby talk. She needs somebody that can talk to her, but she wants to communicate. And what happens with us men, this, listen, men, please get this revelation because this is what God taught me. I didn't know how to talk to my wife because nobody taught me how to talk to my wife. Nobody taught me how to communicate with my wife. So as a man, I really didn't know how to pray. In other words, I didn't know how to talk to God. So if I don't know how to talk to God, how am I going to ask Him how to fix what is messed up? I didn't know how to communicate with God. So if I don't know how to communicate with God, it means I'm not going to spend time with God. I will go to church. I may even read the Bible. But if I don't spend time with him, Jesus said, go into the secret place and shut the door. You and I were created to have intimacy with God. You and I were not created for our spouse or anybody to be God to us. And we have no right demanding that that person meet all of my criteria and all of my needs. That's the height of selfishness. See, when, when a person demands that a person meet all of their need, that person is mean, they're demanding, they're critical, and they're judgmental. They don't understand the relationship that God has created them for. The Lord spoke to my heart and he said this. He said, I want you to go and look at the fruit of the Spirit because he said, son, that is in you. You're just not allowing it to manifest. You're not allowing it to manifest because the spirit is warring against the flesh and you're allowing the flesh to win in this particular area because you want to rule and reign. You want to have it your way. That's the reason you eat at Burger King all the time. <laughs> you, you want to have it your way. So, so anyway, he says, that's the way you want it. You, it's all about you. It's not about you. It's not even about your family. It's all about you. And see, I had the same mindset going into ministry. It's all about me. It's all about the ministry. That's what it was all about. My messages, what I could do, the results that I could get. And all of a sudden, I found myself not preaching with the love of God like I should. Not preaching with the grace and the mercy of God. I would preach a lot of times hard. Now I understand how to bring the, the, the truth with love and how God loves us. But see, that's the same way it was in my household. Same identical way. I didn't know how to speak with love. It was all about me. What are you going to give to me? What are you going to, how are you going to meet my needs? What are you doing? And if she was not meeting my needs enough, then something's totally wrong with her. She needs to get saved again. She needs to get filled with the Spirit again. She needs to respond to these altar calls because, hey, look at me, man. I am righteous. No, I was self-righteous. And not only was I self-righteous, but I was a hypocrite. Because I could go and do all this wonderful ministry things and then come back in my house and act like a pure jerk. And then get out in public and going, hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, God does not like that. It's not something that he enjoys or he likes. See, I have that anointing of being an open book to you. 
to let you know that it's been a process with me. It has not happened overnight. I have made some mistakes. I have hurt my wife. I've, I, I, there was times that because of my family, my family was a family that we got in each other's face and argued, stand toe to, I mean, we face to face. We should have been, our last name should have been Ninja. That's who we are. So, so I also had, my mom was very domineering. And she was strong in the way she would talk and do things. Well, guess what? I become, my, my dad was very passive. My dad would leave and go fishing and hunting. He stayed out in the woods. He stayed hunting and fishing. He'd only come home for dinner. Didn't want to do it. So, so I'm watching all Wonder of this. Wonder why. <laughs> so, so I'm watching all of this, okay? But see, I couldn't go out to the woods. Later, when I got older, I did. But I couldn't do that. And so I watched all of this happen. So when I came into our marriage, I'm t- constantly talking down to her. I'm, I'm, I'm talking in a manner and I'm talking in a way that is demeaning to her. Almost like she's stupid, you know? That's the way, this is what I brought into. I was spirit-filled, born again, and loved God with all of my heart. But I was dealing with things in the flesh, and I didn't know how to deal with them. Good. And that's when I started spending time in my prayer closet, saying, God, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be condescending. I don't want to be like this. God, and I knew it was wrong. And I said, God, you got to help me. You got to change me. And that's when God said, go over to the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians, the fifth chapter, he said, go over to the fruit of the Spirit. He said, look at the fruit of the Spirit. He said, I want you to start asking the Holy Spirit every day. And I want you to name those things off to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. He said, son, you have a relationship with me. You have a relationship with Jesus but you don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Even though you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, ask the Holy Spirit to allow these things, to open yourself up so that can be accomplished. and Allow that in your life. And then he said, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and I want you to start confessing over yourself. Al is kind, gentle, all, all of the things that are listed there. He said, I want you to go, and I want you to start confessing that, and I want you to start thanking me because that is my will for your life. That, he said, that is the definition of who I am. And so, when I went there and I started praying, and I started reading some books, I, I sought some help, I had, a, I had a gentleman in my life that spoke into my life and helped me immensely. I went to men's conferences that helped me a bunch. And all of a sudden, I began to grow. And I found out that this flesh is real. And I found out that when I looked at all the works of the flesh, I saw so many characteristics in there that I was manifesting. And by the way, you can't come down here after service and get the flesh cast out. Too bad. <laughs> that makes us it. reliant on him. Matter of fact, you can't, you can't pray for somebody to change the flesh. The flesh doesn't change. You have to crucify okay. the flesh. And that's the reason that, that the Paul got the revelation of this. And here's what he did. He said this, put off the old man. Right. Put it off. In other words, you don't, you, see, I was crying, Jesus, make me like this. Jesus, help me. He said, no. He said, this is what you do in relationship with me, and then it's your responsibility that when it comes, put it off. Right. You have the power to put it off. So when I started asking the Holy Spirit to help me, I asked the Holy Spirit to help me to love just like Jesus loved, 
to love, and I asked him to do this thing, and I started speaking what 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter says about love. That's the reason the Apostle Paul said, you know, out of all the things, all the revelations that I have, church, this is what Paul said. He said, out of all the revelations I have, he said, this is the one thing I want you to get. I want you to understand the height, the width, the depth, and the breadth of God's love. Yeah. I want you to have spiritual information, spiritual knowledge concerning that love. And so, as a process, I found out the flesh doesn't have power over me unless I empower it. And she cannot meet my four basic needs. Only God can. And if I don't spend some time with him, just sit in his presence and just say, Lord, help me in this area. Lord, God will speak to you. He is alive. Yes. He has a voice. Yay. He will speak to you. And not only that, when I began to read the Word of God, things began to stand out as I read the Word like never before. And I began to watch myself change over a period of time. Totally, completely changed by the love of God and by spending time in His presence. So if you spend time in His presence, you're going to be changed. That's right. You're, 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 you're literally... You, you won't come out like Moses where you're shining. But you'll come out and you'll look different. And I guarantee you that you'll be a different person. I guarantee you yep. that your whole life will completely revolutionize and be changed. And I will guarantee you that you'll end up having a marriage. That at 32 years we can say we're still on our honeymoon. We're still on our honeymoon. We still love one another. We still, we're still so thankful for what God has done. And, and for you singles, that's the key. Don't start spending time in his presence after you get married. You start spending time in his presence right now. You start spending time while you have the time in his word right now. And allow him to build that foundation and realize that your acceptance, your identity, your security, and your purpose can only come from the God who created you. That's right. No human yeah. being can get it. And when you understand that. You won't be drawn off. That's good. And, and that person is not the meaning of my life. Even because of my foundation now. Even if she had walked out on me or I had walked out on her because of the foundation we have, we would have not lost our lives. We would, not been, we would have been hurt, grieved, but we would still go forward and we still have destiny. We still truck it. We still move on. Right. But my, my desire as a pastor, my desire is to see all of our marriages come to a place that people look at us and recognize Jesus is in that house. Jesus is in that house. But let me just say this. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't right. mean that we don't at times don't lose our temper or the times right. that we say things that we wish we hadn't said. But it's what you do and if you love, truly love, it's what you do after you respond to it and you recognize, I don't want to be like this. I don't want that to happen. Go to God. God, help me. God, I humble myself before you right now, Lord. I get on my knees and my face before you. In other words, if you want to change, get some carpet stuck up your nose. Get, 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 get yourself where all of a sudden you do it. If you really want to change, if you want to stay selfish, if you want to just stay the way you are, then don't go in that place. Because if you go in that place, you're going to be touched by God. You're going to be changed by God. Because the moment you go in there and you make an appointment with God and say, I'm coming in with you and I don't want to come out the same. When you do that, I guarantee you it's going to make all the difference in the world.